Good evening, everyone, so far. Good to see you. Hi, Sue. Good to see you, too. Hi, Ryan. Are you, you're the bookkeeper in Goldendale? I am. Well, nice to see you. Thank I you. I have the pleasure of meeting you yet. <laughs> I'm learning. Well there? <laughs> if it, we're trying. Yes, it's okay. going fine. Good. Carrie's been a big help. Oh, good. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. Hello, how are you? Good. Doing a presentation from, from seven to eight. So. You're on top of somebody, are you? Not well. I just wanted to say hi. I haven't seen you in a while. So. I don't know. But what did you guys decide on the seat cover thing? On the, on the toilet seat covers? Uh, was there Sorry, a question? Are holding you on that? No.
Okay, well, we'll wait a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. That's right. Oh, I got right. 701 actually. We'll just give it a couple more minutes. Some people are coming in a little late. Okay, I think I think we should go ahead and start. Um, welcome everybody tonight to the Magnificat Le uh, Parish Leadership Workshop. Um, I'm Sue Schoolcraft. I'm the CFO here at the Diocese of Yakima. Um, for just for introductions, uh, we would like it if everybody puts their first and last name in the chat so that we have an attendance and you can get credit for the class. And if you would like a copy of the uh, presentation recording or a copy of the slides, just put in your email address into the chat and we'll send that to you. And then you uh, feel free to ask any questions or make any comments in the chat during the presentation. Um, we can stop and ask questions during, throughout, or, uh, or you know, whenever is uh, the best breaking point through between the slides. Um, okay, I'm going to start with talking about the Capital Revolving Program. It's the CRP. This is the Savings and Loan uh, Corporation for the Diocese. Basically, we, we created the CRP. It's a separate corporation, separate from the diocese. It's, uh, it's for the purpose of ensuring responsible administration and protection of the temporal goods of the Diocese of Yakima, its parishes, schools, cemeteries, and missions. And Catholic Chari Charities also has deposits in the CRP. It, it was created in 2010, in October. And the way it's set up structure-wise is Bishop is the president, and there is a board of directors made up of five to seven individuals from varying, varying backgrounds who serve terms very, you know, from one, one or more terms of three years. There's an ex officio position, which is bishop's position, the chancellor of the diocese, which is Monsignor Seiler, and the vicar general of the diocese, which is Monsignor Ecker, and the chair of the diocesan finance council also sits on the CRP board of directors. And the role of the board is to review and discuss the investments, the loans, and all other business affairs. We meet quarterly, four times a year. The, all of the money that goes in the CRP is invested. It's owned by the depositors. So if the parishes own their own money, the schools own their own money. They're just, it's just like a savings and loan, like I said. 
Um, it's their money. It's just in a set aside in a separate corporation and it's invested and the earnings net of expenses are distributed to all the depositors every quarter. Um, they're managed by an investment firm out of Bellevue. They're called Highland Capital Management. We've got David Rowe there is our lead guy. Um, they reconcile those quarterly returns that go out to the depositors every quarter. All of the funds that are invested in uh, are socially screened, uh, SRI screened, socially responsible investing. Uh, per US CCB guidelines. So um, we're sticking to those guidelines and not investing in any companies that don't meet those screening guidelines. The financial, financial statements are audited every year by an outside CPA firm. Right now we're using a firm out of Spokane, Dingus Zeracor, um, and that uh, they get audited every year. So June 30 is the fiscal year end. And so they just, a couple of months ago, finished the audit for the June 30, 2021 year end. Those audited financials can be found on the diocesan website, and there's a link there you can follow to find those. Sue, I had a question. Sure. Do you know what the fees are, the investment fees? What do they charge? The fees. Um, it's very so Highland Capital Management charges a flat fee for their management of those funds. They're basically uh, man, uh, watching the investments and what they're invested in, making sure they're meeting the um, the benchmarks. And when funds aren't meeting those benchmarks, then we move stuff around. And it's um, they have a flat fee. We have all of the funds are uh, housed at U.S. Bank, basically, or um, what's UBS, the UBS, probably. So and. They, U.S. Bank is the trading tool. Uh, Highland Capital tells them where to put the money and uh, U.S. Bank is the one that does all the trades. And the money, is a lot of it's in CBIS, Christian Brothers Investment Services. Um, so U.S. Bank charges a fee. It's, and I don't have that exact amount in front of me. I think it's, it's a, just a, I can look that up a little later if you want the details on those fees. But we're no, it's okay. It's just a lot of times the advisors can really get you on fees, so you got to be careful on the fees. Right, right. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting charged from Highland Capital by U.S. Bank, and then internally within the funds that we choose, there are built-in fees with those as as items are traded as well. Which I, I'm not yeah. sure what all those rates are. Very good. And uh, so to continue, but when it when we began this in 2010, the CRP was funded with deposits of 11 and a half million. And as of September 30th, and we, we're just finishing October's now, we're still waiting on some reports from US Bank from October, but um, the, we're, we're at over 38 million in deposits now in the CRP. So it's grown quite a bit over the years. What we invest in it mainly, the, the CRP general investment group is 70% fixed income, 30% equities. That's what we call CRP reserves. We also have an option for what we call FICA, federally insured cash account which is money market basically it doesn't earn a lot of interest right now when we first uh, got into that it was earning two, over two almost three percent interest but with the market as it's been in the last year it has dropped and it's, it's well below one percent now but it doesn't uh, sustain any losses so it's um, fdic insured and it doesn't it, it, there's a no risk in it um a little more detail on the FICA. They use a network of eight, 800 to 1,000 banks, which provide FDIC protection for up to 25 million in total investments. Um, we've got 12.6 million in FICA as of uh, September 30th. Uh, we started it back in March of 2019. Average investment earnings, like I said, right now was, was right around 0.47%. It's not very good, but it's better than any and sustaining any losses with, with the volatile market that we've had lately. 
Um, so it's it's the the purpose of it is to keep short term cash plus uh, building fund donations safe from market fluctuations. So it, that's what the option is. Why the option is there. Uh, some information about the rest of the balances. We've got uh, a million. At, at, at the end of September, we had a million forty seven in cash sitting there. And we usually don't have that much cash set aside, but we had a pretty large um, loan getting ready to distribute out. So that's why we had a little bit of extra cash in there. The deposits in FICA, as I mentioned earlier, 12, just under 12.6 million. Um, the deposits in the CRP reserves, 20.89 million. And my phone's ringing, I'm gonna decline that. Um, 20.89 million in CRP reserves. And we have loans as well in CRP. We've got just under 4.5 million in loans right now for the total of 38.9 million at the end of September. Um, this is a chart uh, created by Highland Capital Management at, as of the, the quarter end of September 30, which is one of our quarter ends where we just we, where we distribute all the earnings to the depositors. And this is the history of the rates of how we're, how it's been doing on the CRP reserves and the FICA reserves. So, I mean, the one year rate, 9.98%, it's pretty good. The last year it's done well. Three year, 7.46, five year annualized, 6.43 in the reserves. There's cash management policy in the diocese, which is part of um, what funds this, or it's not really funded, it's just the savings for the parishes. Parishes and schools basically are, they all have their own checking accounts. What they're supposed to hold in those checking accounts is just up to 45 days operating cash. And that can be calculated just once a year at, you know, at the June 30 year end, calculate your annual total expenses divided by 365 days and multiply that by 45 days to get your 45 days operating cash. And that's approximately what should be kept in the operating account for checking account. Anything between 45 days and 180 days is supposed to be deposited into a FICA account. And the idea there is to keep six months operating cash very liquid but protect it from potential lawsuits because if the diocese gets sued or any parish gets sued, any money sitting in the checking account, that's that 45 days is uh, at risk of, of being taken in a lawsuit. It's putting it in the CRP puts a little bit of extra protection. It's not 100% foolproof as nothing is, but it puts that firewall through in between so that it's much less likely to be taken in a lawsuit if if the diocese or the parish or was sued. So that's the purpose of the CRP is to protect that money. That way you have the liquid, eight, liquid cash up to six months, but you've got a lot of it protected in the CRP. It's easily accessible, but it's protected. Um, our operating cash, if you have over 180 days operating cash, it's supposed to be deposited into the CRP reserves. And the idea with that is it's there for the long term. Um, and, and that's why the investment is 70-30. It's a little more aggressive and it's going to fluctuate over time. But in the long term, its goal is to earn more over, you know, over the long term less than a year or over, I mean, more than a year. Depositors, you know, it's like I said, it's easy to request money out of the CRP. You just send a check request form to the diocese and, and we'll distribute that money out of the CRP account to the depositors as needed. Is that for any reason, Sue? So? Pretty much. I mean, we have some guidelines for if it's for a building project, obviously, and, and yeah. I'll talk more about that on the, uh, the Saturday morning zoom for the magnificat on saturday morning when i talk about the construction policies so there there's some um, stricter cash distribution policies around just the building projects but other than that it's it's as needed 
Do we do we need to say what it's for? Not necessarily. Yeah. Well, we like to know what it's for, but it's you know it's not gonna you know okay. you're still gonna be able to get the money. It, those forms have to be signed by the pastors, and if the pastor needs the money or the principals for the schools, then then we're gonna <laughs> distribute it out because it's their money. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, we started the FICA back in 2019, so it's slowly, not everybody has gotten money put in there, but technically if, if any location has over 45 days operating cash, but less than 180 days, they should have money in the FICA accounts. And this, these are the parishes, only 26 out of the 40 locations have, have it so far. So just this a list of the ones that do have it so far, have money saved in the FICA accounts. Uh, I'll go over loans real briefly. We The CRP makes loans. So basically when you, you're taking a loan from the CRP, you're borrowing money from all of the other parishes and schools that have deposits in there. So that's why we have some guidelines. The CRP board uh, reviews all of the loans before they are recommended for approval to the bishop. Um, the loan rate is currently is 5%. It's Knights of Columbus loan rate plus 1%. And so I haven't checked. Uh, the last time I checked, the Knights of Columbus rate was 4%. So a CRP loan would, would a current one would be 5%. And generally, they're over 10 years. But that fluctuates based on the needs of the borrower. Um, for building projects, the loan, the, the location asking for the loan has to have at least 50% of the approved project value on hand, and they need to have the other half promised in pledges before they can get a loan. And basically, you're, we're, we're looking for collateral on how they're going to pay that loan back. Is it, so it's got to be in their deposits plus their um, pledges for that project before they can a loan can be just uh, approved by the CRP board unless there's some special exceptions which they can always make special exceptions. We do have and I don't have a slide about it, but we are starting up a poor parish type loan fund with some slightly different requirements and so from for some of the poorer parishes that can't meet the regular guidelines of having 50% cash on hand and 50% in pledges. Um, but that, that's still in the works. We're working on those terms. So that, that is coming soon. So this is just an example of the loans. So the balance of, of the loan capacity in the CRP right now. So the balance in the CRP reserves, this is, and I, sh I should back up a second. The, um, the, guy, uh, the bylaws of the CRP pretty much state, or the investment policy, I think it is, states that we, because we can't borrow 100% of all the deposits. We obviously don't want to do that. Um, so we have a 50% rule. 50% of CRP reserves is what we can borrow and the CRP reserves does not include the FICA. So CRP reserves are at 20.8 million, 50% of that is 10.4 million. Um, we've got CRP loan balances plus outstanding lines of credit that haven't been drawn upon out there of 9.1 million. So the loan capacity right now is only 1.3 million based on this calculation as of uh, September 30th. Oh, I did put a slide in there about it. Okay, so this is a new, I'm sorry, I forgot that I did that. Um, so we haven't given any of these loans out yet. We do have one parish that is interested in doing it. We're gonna, these, these are the proposed terms that, that we're doing. So we're gonna start basically a new set of deposit accounts that will help pay the difference in interest. So. The new initiative fund loans will distribute loans at, at the uh, 
basically about 1%, the, whatever the AF, the closest applicable federal rate is at the time of the loan. And the difference between that and 4% is what is going to be funded by these special new initiative fund deposit accounts. And the diocese will put in the first 200,000 for that to pay. So that way, all of the other depositors aren't losing money on the interest for these types of loans. Um, the poor, the poorer parishes would need to present financial data to help calculate what their loan payment would be. So they need to figure out how much their loan payment could be, the amount of the loan, and then we'll figure out what those payments would be in the term of the loan based on that information. And they have to have an active capital campaign going to, uh, to show that they can repay that loan as well. But like I said, it's in the works. It's not set in stone yet, but these are the ideas for that type of loan. Well, that's all I have on the CRP, but I have a lot of slides on the finance policy. So I wanted to do the CRP first to get that out of the way so I wouldn't have run out of time and not get to it. Any questions on the slides for the CRP? I didn't check the chat, but I don't see any questions in the chat. So I think we're good. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the other presentation. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the finance policies and procedures slide? Okay. So let's roll on that. I'm, I have a lot of slides. I'll probably scoot through some of these pretty quickly because there's a lot of detail in here, but I'll hit the highlights. Basically, the financial objectives of the, these policies and procedures is number one, to protect the temporal goods of the parishes and the schools and all of our locations. And the main temporal goods we're talking about is cash. So we, we all, you know, we're, we're collecting donor dollars and we want to protect those donor dollars and use them wisely for the purpose that the donors expect us to use them for. So that those are the, you know, that's the number one reason for having a set of financial policies. Plus we want to make sure that all the locations have the funding to operate on. That's why we have budgets and so forth. And we want to make sure that everybody's completing financial reporting um, transparency, basically, to the parishioners, to the finance councils, the pastoral counselors, and, as, and everybody else to know uh, what's going on with the cash and the reporting of the assets. Put up the map of our regions of the diocese just to, so you can see how uh, the expansion of it. This map is slightly off as Prosser is and considered to be in the Bent Benton County deanery, but we've got Chelan County and we've got the parishes there Bridgeport, Mansfield, Chelan, Waterville, Leavenworth, Leavenworth, Cashmere, and Le I should say Leavenworth and Cashmere are now basically replaced by Peshast and we're building a new church there, but they're still doing services in the Kashmir location. We did sell the, the um, church in Leavenworth. So that's no, there's no longer services going on there. And then we have East Wenatchee and Wenatchee. In Kittitas County, we've got Clay Ellum, Roslyn and Ellensburg, um, Yakima, yeah, we have Natchez, Kawichi, Sela. We have, uh, in Yakima, we have Holy Redeemer, Holy Family, and St. Joseph, and we have Moxie, and there's a St. Joseph Mission at the Atanum here in Yakima County as well. For Click Attack County, we're looking at White Salmon, Goldendale, uh, Mabton, Grandview, Sunnyside, Granger, Toppenish, Zilla, Wapato, and White Swan, and Benton County in our Tri-Cities area, Prosser, Benton City, Richland, and Kennewick. 
And then in Grant County, there's uh, Mattawa, Royal City, Quincy, Ephrata, Moses Lake, Warden, Cooley City, Heartline, and as far north as Grand Cooley. So there's 40, 40 parishes and six schools in the Diocese of Yakima. Right now we've got everybody using QuickBooks desktop software and we're, we've got everybody doing it remotely through a third party network called Right Networks. And so all data can be accessed remotely. The only location that's not on that is Calvary Cemetery right now due to a specific cemetery program that doesn't work on the cloud. But everybody else, all the parishes and schools are all using that QuickBooks. That means I can access everybody's QuickBooks account from my desk. I don't necessarily do that, but it's pretty handy when I get questions from locations that I can go in and look at their books and help them maybe solve a problem. Um, plus, like we go in and we pull monthly financial statements that saves everybody a step and not having to print them and send them to the diocese every month. They just need to send they just send their banks, bank statements and bank reconciliations and then we know to go pull the financials for that month. So it's pretty handy. Um, each location pays a small fee annually for their use of that. Um, the diocese pays for the QuickBooks uh, licenses and the payroll. So we're, we're footing the bill for everything. So we're just asking for a little bit from all the locations. Last year, we charged 700 per location for the year. Um, everyone knows about our annual Catholic appeal that we, the campaign that we put on every year, we just started it, the new 22, 2022 campaign this last November 1st. We calculate those annual goals for each parish uh, by taking 16 and percent of the total offertory income, which is basically Sunday collections and holy days. Um, that percentage gets voted on every year by Presbyteral Council and the Finance Council of the diocese. And it's, it, it's normally 16%, but the last two years due to the pandemic and the drop in donations, we've increased it just a hair to help fund the diocese, because basically that money funds the operations of the diocese and we fund uh, that money goes toward all the programs that the diocese uh, uh, serves. And I've got a little bit of the description about offertory income. Sometimes there's some question about what all gets included in that. It's all the envelope and the loose money collected at mass, uh, receipts received through the mail or dropped off at the rectory or the parish office offerings made by children, uh, receipts that are given periodically in lieu of the weekly offering, those go towards Sunday collections. Receipts obviously can come in the form of electronic or checks or currency. Um, and also we, you know, we sometimes get real property donated or stocks. Um, doesn't include collections for any specific perfect purpose or there's restricted donations um, or any of the national collections or those types of things just the pure um, tithing basically for the Sunday collections and the Holy Days. Background checks are something that we require all employees and volunteers who have an unsupervised, ongoing unsupervised contact with children, youth or vulnerable adults or those who will handle money. So bookkeepers, collection counters, ushers, money handlers, all those people should satisfy a background check. Um, we keep those results 100% confidential and only negative results are shared with, with the pastors or whoever is the supervisor asking for that background check. Um, and those records are kept here at the diocese under lock and key and we don't share those with anyone unless it's a, as a need to know basis, I suppose, toward just toward the pastor. But it's pretty important that way we make sure that we're we've got you know we're tracking with people for to protect our our parishioners and our and our children and youth. So one of the uh, guidelines of the diocese for the finance policies is we uh, every location obviously has to have its own bank account 
um, at least one operating account. They can have more than one, but if they do, we just, the guidelines are that the bishop has to be a signer on all bank accounts of every location, along with the pastor. The schools will have the principal added usually. Um, sometimes they'll have a member of the finance council on there, but the bookkeeper can never be a signer. The person or whoever's creating the checks shouldn't also be able to sign them um, as, a, as a protection, a separation of duties. Um, and each, you know, each bank account is kept separate for that location under, because each location has their own respective tax ID number. And that's how those bank accounts should be set up. Savings accounts are not permitted at all outside of the CRP. And that's a, a guideline by the bishop. Um, the, and, and the reason for that is, to, again, to protect that money and put that firewall in between us and a, a potential lawsuit, basically. If you put it in a regular savings account, that money would be exposed to potential lawsuits. If you put it in the CRP, it's more protected. Um, and then again, the reminder about the 45 days operating cash and that the bank statements for all bank accounts for every location should always be mailed to the location's office. And they should be reviewed by finance council members once a month. So usually those can be presented at finance council meetings. Bookkeeper's responsibilities. Basically, you know, maintain those financial records in an accurate and timely manner. Make sure that the bills are getting paid. Um, make sure they're performing their duties in a competent manner and exhibiting strong ethical values at all times. Um, we have a good insurance policy for liabilities for, you know, for any incidents of misappropriation of assets, if that ever is observed, um, then that should be reported. And one of the things Bishop likes to stress, especially since we, you know, we have so many locations and so many different people, you know, every pastor is the boss of their own location. And some want to do things a certain way, some want to do them another way. Um, if bookkeepers are asked to do anything that's against finance policies, we, we ask them to, to not be afraid to call me, call me, or someone at the diocese to, to ask what to do, you know, and we'll help them work, work through it. Because um, it does happen. And, um, you know, we don't sweat the little stuff, but if sometimes there's, there's bigger things going on and it's good to be aware. And then maybe we, sometimes we need to take action and um, talk to that person that has asked them to do something against policy. Budgeting, every location should be doing a budget every year. It's, you know, it's it's a really good way to just plan ahead and look, you know, make sure that you're meeting your financial objectives and paying, able to pay those bills and able to operate. Um, we, you know, we don't have to, the schools, we do ask for copies of their budgets. We don't ask for everybody to submit budgets to the diocese, but it should be it's something that should be done and it should be reviewed with the finance council um, and approved every year before the next fiscal year begins. We already talked about CRP, so I'll skip through this really quickly. Um, you know, we talked about the number of days operating cash, what should be in your checking account, what should be in the CRP to be protected, and then the loans. We've got some special cash receipts procedures. Um, this is for other than Sunday offertory collections. Always keep cash receipts if that are deposited right away in a locked file cabinet or a safe. Um, the general guideline is get that money deposited between 24 and 48 hours of receipt. That's the, the best. But if it can't be deposited right away, make sure it's locked up and protected. Um, the mail shouldn't be opened by the bookkeeper. And these are kind of just separation of duties things that we like to, internal controls type things. Envelopes and checks 
Um, those are the, the parishioner envelopes that generally have their names on them and so forth, should be listed in total before being turned over to the bookkeeper for deposit. Um, checks can be immediately endorsed for a deposit only by who's opening the mail. The cop and they make a list of the money that's come in. The list goes to the bookkeeper. Um, and then uh, it's compared later for the bank deposit. And the cash delivered by hand should be recorded with a pre numbered receipt to the donor. For offertory collections, those are the ones collected at mass generally. We use those pre numbered tamper evidence bags. And I know you see those, you've seen those in mass with at least two people present at all times um, with the bag. And then they should be counted by collection counting committees. Each parish should have its own committee set up more than at least three to five counting teams so that they can rotate duties. Um, team members of those teams should be rotated on a regular basis. All counters need a back background and credit checks. Um, and it's all and money should always be counted with two or more unrelated individuals. Um, never just one person counting the money. It's all uh, you know, and, and, and to not be related. You don't want husband and wife or brother and sister in the same room counting the money. We want to have unrelated individuals. Uh, they compile a cash collection report and they all the members sign it. Um, checks and envelopes need to be recorded and tracked for future record keeping so that we can send those annual gift acknowledgements in every January for the previous calendar year. And um, 24 to 48 hours is the how quickly you should ideally be depositing those funds. So one to two days. Um, charge accounts, that's, I don't know if it, th those are used as much anymore with certain businesses that allow charge accounts. Um, if so, you know, we, we kind of have just guidelines. Authorized users should be limited to two people. Uh, that list should be kept for the authorized merchants and vendors and approved by the pastor. Receipts for all purposes, purchases um, are required to be attached and reconciled to those monthly statements. And those statements should be, be reviewed by the pastor or the chair of the finance council. If the, if the location is a credit card, um, that we have some special guidelines and we have a uh, credit card authorization that for all users or people carrying those cards, which you know generally would be the pastor and maybe one or two people in the office that are in management positions. Um, they're signing a statement acknowledging agreement to adhere to the terms of the credit card policy, basically that they're gonna use this card only for business. They're gonna make sure their purchases are pre-approved by the pastor. Um, they're not gonna ever use it for personal use. Uh, they're going to return in their credit card receipts for all the purchases that are made with that card. And they're going to indicate on the back of that receipt the who, what, when, where, the business purpose of that uh, purchase. And those records go with the bank's the credit card statement every month before that statement. And it should be paid off every month and not carry a balance. And all that activity needs to be recorded in QuickBooks on the, for the financial records. We have a standard standardized chart of accounts for all the dioceses. When I came on board in uh, October of 2014, everybody was using their own chart of accounts pretty much. It was all over the board. I mean, there was kind of a set guideline, but then locations would just add account numbers at will. And so we've changed that to now where there's a set chart of accounts. If anyone has a desire to add a new account, they need to contact me and then we can add it for everybody. So we're not we're not uh, going to have account numbers that are different for, for uh, they're, they're the same for all locations. So we can combine the statements every year and do that pretty easily. Uh, and we don't have to look at the titles and everything. So that set chart of accounts is out there on uh, in the Finance Council's one of the appendixes and um, you can add sub accounts under any of those 
main account numbers to provide more detail as as needed and the, and you don't have to ask me that um, about those first you can just go ahead and do those sub accounts as well and we're going to spend a little bit of time on clergy compensation pre you know as you probably all know priests compensation and benefits they have a unique status with the irs they're basically recognized as self-employed persons when they go to file their individual tax returns. So when they earn wages, their wages are not subject to social, social security tax withholding. Um, they're not required to either do, to do federal withholding on them at either, but they can elect to do that. And we have a special clergy withholding form. It's an appendix out on the, under the uh, finance policies that can be used for the priests so they can make um, withhold have withholding for a federal income tax out of their paychecks but it's it's their choice if they want to do that because if they don't do that then they're probably going to just be making quarterly tax payments on their own um, we do the diocese does reimburse each priest up to two thousand and twenty five dollars a year it's for one half of their annual social security tax up to 2025 and they, but they have to turn in a copy of their self schedule self-employment schedule from each year to request that reimbursement um, and we do report all of their earnings on form w-2 even though they are treated as self-employed there's kind of a, two options they either would either get a w-2 or a 1099 but it is a diocese policy to give them a W-2. So basically their W-2 looks different. It's got wages, federal wages, but not social security wages. And it might have federal withholding if that's what they've elected to do, but it won't have any social security withholding or Medicare. So part of their payments are included in wages are still uh, per, potentially stole fees um, or part of the payments for their services, I should say, although the stole fees remain with the parish. Um, those are the fees presented for baptisms, confirmations, marriages, funerals, and so forth. And we've kind of got some set scales, um, but those can be you know, tweaked up or down as, as uh, decided by the pastor. Um, the offering, offerings given to deacons belong to the deacon, and the parishes can also choose charge for the use of a parish facility. The, these fees are not a required fee. They are an, a requested donation, basically. So uh, the, the diocese basically says, you know, these are the, these are the standard amounts for each of these things, but we can't require them to pay it we we shouldn't be you know it's not something that i mean they should want to pay it but it's not something that's um a charge it's just a requested donation basically clergy members also get gifts from parishioners they're those are private they're they should not be for services performed um, they should not be combined with any special service offerings or stipends, otherwise they look like a wage, an earned wage. Um, they're not recorded on the parish books, they go straight to the priest. They're not taxable to the priest, nor are they tax deductible by the donor. Um, excess, and there, have, there has been a couple lawsuits kind of recently about excessive gifts to priests. And that, you know, so if, if you're getting, if, if a clergy member is getting a lot of gifts and it's noticed and somehow they get audited by the IRS, there's a chance that that could trigger uh, some tax due. Um, some of the things on the case that I, uh, one of the cases that I heard of, the one, the, uh, it wasn't a Catholic priest, it was a different religion, but it was a, a, a a minister of a different religion and he over half of his uh, the majority of his earnings for the year were from gifts so it, that was an excessive uh, example 
but he, he got nailed and they, he ended up having to pay tax on all of that. So something to be aware of for as far as gifts go. We've got mass intentions, which are also called stipends. These are offerings presented by the faithful for celebration of a mass for a definite intention. The, uh, these payments belong to the priest. Uh, normal offering is about $10 per mass. Those should be paid directly to the priest and sh you know, shouldn't be recorded on parish books. However, what happens sometimes is the offering comes in, they don't know when the mass is going to be said or who's going to say it. If that happens, then that money does get deposited by the parish. And then when it's paid out to that priest, when that uh, mass intention is celebrated, then it becomes, it just gets added to their wages. It should be paid through payroll. Because those mass intentions are taxable to the priest, regardless of whether they receive them directly or if it goes through the parish because you know, it should be something that they're recording on their tax return on their own, even if it's not recorded on the parish books. Uh, clergy have obviously a pretty heavy work schedule. They're expected to work a six day work week. They can get one day a week off um, and it can't be Saturday or Sunday because they have all the, their services to do those days. They're entitled uh, to uh, a vacation of up to 31 days to take a month off, basically. They need to make sure they have uh, priests filling in for them while they're gone during their absence. We have a clergy retirement account under the diocese, plus we have a clergy retirement trust, which pays pensions and health premiums for our retired priests. For the clergy retirement fund, which is under the diocese, each parish pays $300 a month per priest per location that goes into the fund and it supports all the other costs other than pension and health premiums for our retired priests. And currently we have 17 uh, fully retired priests on, on, that are receiving pension. Some other clergy benefits that are available that, that uh, they, they get, we will pay up to half of their insurance premium for their car or one vehicle. Um, we have auto allowances that they get every with their paycheck every month. And there's a couple of choices on which what they want there. They get personal food reimbursements up to $600 a month. Um, groceries for the rectory though are are provided for them for their rectory and then those are non-taxable. Business meals obviously too are not taxable to the priest. And the rectory is a furnished home. We, we've, uh, every location provides a furnished home or apartment for their priest. That housing, the value of that housing is taxable to them for self-employment purposes, but is not taxable for federal income tax purposes. So that's something a little different. And, the housing value is something that we can put on the W-2s every year. Or I think what happens a lot of time with that is they have their CPA or whoever's helping them prepare the return come up with a value for their housing, for their filing. Um, agreed upon procedures is something that we have set up. We set up a few years ago. We have an outside CRP. CPA firm, they are the same ones that come in and audit the diocese and the CRP every year. They go out to, we pick a handful of locations every year to, for them to go review the books. And so basically what they do is they go to each location, they are determining how that location is doing as far as following the financial policies and procedures and hoping to help them uh, improve internal controls and governance issues. Um, so, you know, it's not like if we're, but the goal is to help them get better at, at taking care of those temporal goods and protecting the, um, the cash flows and so forth. So, and each location should have a review about every six years. 
Um, they get a report at the end of it. The report states uh, basically what they did right, and then it gives suggestions about things that maybe need to be fixed. And then they're supposed to respond to the diocese with how they're going to uh, address any issues that are pointed out to them and then hopefully move forward and, and get a little bit better with the financial policies at their location. We have a conflict of interest policy. Um, we like each member of the any parish council, building council, pastoral council of all the schools sign an annual conflict of interest form. The purpose of it is to show that the members are committed to ethical, business-like, and lawful conduct, and that they do not possess any unknown conflict of interest to the location by their other affiliations, whether business or personal. And this is one of the things that they'll checklist off on the AEPs when they come out. Do you have your conflict of interest policies in place? Um, the, the annual parish assessment, the diocesanum, is something that we bill every November 1st, and we base it kind of like with the ACA goals. We calculate it based on offertory income minus school subsidies times 6%, and that is an actual tax to the parishes to help uh, provide uh, funds to, for the diocese to operate on. And that gets voted on every year as well with the uh, Finance Council and the Presbyteral Council. For all disbursements that come, that go out from any location, um, we prefer that the pastor sign in the checks or his delegate if he's not present. All checks that are written out of the diet, out of the parishes and the other in the schools and so forth. Always should be supported by invoices. Um, if it's payroll, it should be supported by a payroll summary. There's all, always needs to be substantiation for the business purposes on all those invoices. Unused checks need to be stored in a secure location, a lock safe or file cabinet um, with restricted accessibility. Um, expense reimbursements that go back to employees or pastors always should be accompanied by receipts showing what was purchased and, and the business purpose. And they should also be pre-approved by the pastor before they're even purchased. Um, mileage, re mileage reimbursements should always be accompanied by a, a mileage log, a detailed mileage log that shows number of miles driven, for what purpose, and so for the dates. Um, and that's what needs to be turned in to get the mileage log or to get the mileage reimbursement. We have some electronic banking guidelines and that's it's getting more and more popular to do things electronically as we all you know have the getting more technic technology every day. Um, a lot of places have remote deposit scanners. Um, and so we have some some guidelines for that and how many days 14 days to keep copies of those things before shredding them. Um, online bank statements, a lot of places are going out and pulling their own bank statements online. Um, they should still be reviewed by the uh, finance chairs. Um, and in, invoices are oftentimes emailed. So, um, and that's okay, but it's something to be, make sure to keep track of so that to make sure all the bills are getting paid. Electronic disbursements, same thing. Um, Always make sure there's there's adequate computer safeguards and software to protect that financial information um, in the cyber age. I'm going to speed through the rest of this as we're running out of time. Um, electronic receipts. Uh, those would be for when we have donations coming in electronically, which I think is happening more and more now, especially with COVID and uh, restricted access and not not as much in-person stuff going on. Just always making sure that uh, we are protecting that that data, keeping it secure. Broad policy, um, just 
an awareness there, any, you know, witnessing any type of these things going on, be sure to report them. And there's a, there's a process for reporting those. And that's all uh, noted here in the, in the finance policies. We have some special guidelines for fundraising. Um, the fundraiser bank accounts should, you know, same as all other bank accounts, should it be under the parish or school tax ID number and the pastor and the bishop need to be signers. Always document expenses and um, everything, receipts, everything attached for all expenses. And any debit or credit cards for fundraising are not authorized at this time. So if there's any of that going on, um, maybe think about changing that. There's some special fundraising receipt collections, very similar to our other uh, collections. Uh, the receipt processes, just protecting, having at least two people counting, getting that money deposited within 24 to 48 hours, or, or you know, locking it up in a secure fireproof, fireproof safer location. Um, reviewing the bank statements, reconciling those, doing financial statements for those uh, fundraisers and so forth. And all the volunteers need to have credit checks and signed confidentiality statements and background checks for volunteers. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to keep flying through these. Um, gambling, you know, this is these things like raffles, uh, bingo, casino nights. Uh, make sure you're always following those gambling guidelines by, from Washington State, and there's a, the link to the Washington State uh, Gambling Commission's webpage. You want to make sure that uh, you're following all those guidelines and, and filing all the forms needed if any kind of gambling event is done. And, a lot of them, um, the larger ones, need uh, a letter from the diocese, from the bishop, with permission to do that. We have some health and safety guidelines. We want to make sure we keep our employees safe and report any incidents um, or any type of accidents that happen. We have our insurance policy with Catholic Mutual, and we have a, a procedure for reporting accidents to them and making sure we're getting the coverage we need for anything that happens. Um, kind of repeat on some of the internal controls again, you know, a lot of this is in some of the other slides. Um, so I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but we wanna make sure that we're protecting that, those, protecting the cash, protecting those donor dollars, and that you know things are money's not going out the door that, that where it should not be going. And pastors' responsibilities, and I put some guidelines down here for what a parish finance council should be doing. Um, and these are these are listed out in our finance policies as well. Um, they should the the pastor appoints the finance council members. They should establish their own bylaws. There should be between three and five members to serve a limited term. Um, whenever we have a change in pastor, then there's a change in hands on the council as well after six months. Um, that finance council will assist the pastor with the annual budget, monthly financial statement reviews, any other uh, financial queries as needed. They should meet at least quarterly. Um, if there's a parochial school attached to the parish, then the finance council can assist the pastor with all matters related to the financial support for the school, what the school subsidy should be. Um, the finance council will help the, assist the pastor to assure participation with the ACA campaign. And um, they can also assign a person to be a liaison to the pastoral council. So sometimes I get a lot of questions about what's the goal of the finance council. And so I wanted to throw some of those out there to, to the group. Um, we've got some guidelines for payroll. We, you know, every location for all their employees need, need to keep personnel files with all the proper documents in them. 
The I-9s can be kept in a separate storage location, but, and for the priests, we keep those here at the pastoral office because we do I-9s for all of the priests as well. Um, and we wanna make sure we're, we're following all the state and payroll reporting requirements and making those tax payments timely. Um, we also have uh, requirements to file form 1099s for any payments made out to independent contractors. So we need to make sure we do that every year and any uh, locations with a gambling activity needs to file a W2Gs uh, when they're required and take withholding out if they have winnings over $5,000. $5, Real estate transactions, we'll talk a lot more on the, uh, the Saturday uh, Magnificat about that, but all contracts get signed by the bishop and need to follow the, the construction policies. Um, and special events insurance coverage, that's just coverage that for events that are not par parish sponsored, but they're on parish grounds. And, um, and so there's some guidelines for that. And, and we purchase that coverage through Catholic Mutual. And this is just a list of types of events that they will not cover. And one of the biggies obviously now is they will not cover claims related to the pandemic. So, um, so that's basically kind of uh, stopping a lot of events from happening is they don't wanna take that risk of getting sued because there might be some sort of exposure for the uh, virus. And then just a reminder on the weekend mass counts that, that are done um, twice a year and those counts go to Monsignor Seiler. So I'm out of time and I'm at the end and I don't have a lot of time for questions, but um, did anybody have any questions about some of this? I know I went through it really quickly and there's a lot of detail in the slides. So we can certainly put in your email in the chat and we'll send you a copy of the slide deck so that you can read through those. But any questions for, for me tonight? And I'm going to say, look at the chat. And I don't see any questions for the chat. So I think we're good. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I really appreciate sitting through my uh, probably boring. <laughs> hope I didn't bore you to death too much with the, with the financial policies. So. Okay. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Um, well, have a great night, and uh, we'll, we'll call it. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Thank you, Sue. All righty. Good night. Good night.